You're listening to the Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy, where we cover sales, investing, and entrepreneurship with an emphasis on real estate. Each podcast, Terrence and his guests will bring you informative and inspiring information within the real estate industry. The Real Estate Entrepreneur Podcast with Terrence Murphy. Today, I'm excited to have Hunter Goodwin. Hunter is an owner of Olden Goodwin Group, currently serves as the president and COO. He's responsible for implementing the company's business strategies, launching new ventures, initiatives, overseeing ongoing operations, and developing synergistic business relationships. He specializes in asset management, development of commercial multifamily, hospitality, properties, utilizing his extensive experience in construction management and business operations. Prior to real estate, Hunter was a professional athlete for eight years and was the team captain of the Miami Dolphins for 1999-2000 season. He served as the Miami Dolphins representative of the Players Union, 2000-2001. He also served as Fox Sports College Game Day Analyst in 2005. He was a consultant and a commentator for the 2003 NFL Draft. And Hunter enjoys fishing, hunting, and lives in College Station with his beautiful wife, Amber, and their two children. And he's doing some amazing things in the real estate space. So I'm excited to have Hunter Goodwin here today with me on The Real Estate Entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. Thank you, Hunter, for being here today, man. The real estate entrepreneur with Terrence Murphy. Today, our guest is Hunter Goodwin. He's a friend of mine. He actually was one of the first former Aggie football players that took me under his wings. I had a meeting with him right when I retired and just trying to figure out what was next. And so I'm excited to have him today. Appreciate you being here, brother. Appreciate that too, Murph. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah, man. And so I want to start off uh, with a quote. The wise young man or the wage earner of today invest his money in real estate, Andrew Carnegie. So obviously we're going to be talking about real estate. We're going to be talking about your story. Uh, Just kind of give me a quick overview of your story, kind of A to Z. And then how did you get to the point where you're at today in real estate? So T Murph, I grew up in a household where a small town, Belleville, Texas, uh, 50 minutes from here. My father was a small town rural attorney. Uh, He practiced every kind of law, but for, uh, you know, the family law, he didn't do divorce because the town was too small. (laughs) They might burn his house down. But uh, he, he dabbled in and out of real estate. He did all the deeds and uh, deeds of trust and the notes for both of our local banks. He peddled in real estate his whole life. So I kind of grew up around, around it, it. Um, and watched him and every vacation we'd ever go on, we'd look at real estate. So I think that was kind of the foundational backbone. And then as I got into the NFL and began to make my own money, deal flow began to come my way. You know, you should invest in this and invest yep. in that and invest in this and invest in that. and after running a lot of those past, you know, my father for review and vetting, it kind of resolved into, man, you know, you know, you, you know, the space, why take the risk of somebody else bet on yourself and do your own thing. And that's pretty, that's a, a very simplistic distilled down version, but that's yeah. how I got my start. And so your dad was the one who encouraged you to step out and start. Yeah. He, he just always had a belief and an understanding of hard assets and, you know, what I call things that, that, that especially things that God made, even hard assets start with great land. And yeah. we hear it all the time, real estate, real estate's all, all about location, location. So he had a good knack for that. And I just watched him through the years, you know, acquire things. He would make, he would modify them and enhance them and, and make them pretty and kind of in rural Texas where I grew up, we're about a, we're, we're, we're kind of the Hamptons, if you will, of Houston. <laughs> So every Houstonian wanted to come an hour outside of town. Get outside of town. They wanted the small town rural lifestyle, you know, go to the local hamburger shop, wear a cowboy hat, dress in comfortable clothing and have a couple cows, a horse and and live out on the range if they, if, if you will. So that was, that was kind of the vision that he sold. And he would buy a lot of places that were ugly and had some hair on them and they, they weren't beautified. They had a, an old farmhouse that was maybe dilapidated, run down. Um, the fencing wasn't in good repair. They weren't really ready finished products. And Mm -hmm. so his game was buy them at a, at a low, at a low price point and kind of always have the knowledge of where those sales were coming about. And then he would go in and improve them and he'd fence them and he'd, he'd, he'd fix up the, the old farmhouse and kind of make it a quaint, unique experience. He'd put a couple of mama cows out there in a bowl. Usually we ran the black, uh, black baldies, which is a cross between a Brangus and a, uh, a Hereford. Mm-hmm. And that was a real popular thing during that time. And so people would come out and the whole vision of what they thought was ready to go. It was right. It was like, here's Turnkey. the keys, the car's ready to drive. It's full of gas. Yeah. So that, that was kind of his start and 
had a big impression on me and I got to watch that evolve over probably two decades. Yeah. So then obviously you play in the league 10 years, you're a team captain, obviously uh, Aggie Letterman. Um, once you transition out, cause that's a question that I always get from a lot of athletes, actually a lot of guys that are in the NFL right now is what's the first step I should take trying to make that transition. What did you do? And if you could go back and look at it again, what would you have changed about that? You know, I think you, you always can, second guess and and say there's things you could have improved on the the probably the very generic answer to that question is your future career should start the first day you have something that everybody needs is capital wow. right i wow. mean everyone there's a million there's millions of people that have great ideas there's millions of people that that you know can come up with the next great thing but almost every single idea needs capital and oftentimes it's very difficult to get others to give you capital when you don't have a track record, wow. right? It's, it's why guys, it's like why, why our second contract, we were paid more than our first contract yeah. because we were a proven commodity, not a, not a, we might work commodity. Mm, that's good. So I think that for me, when I got my own capital and I got my own ability to, to do some deals, that's something that NFL players are lucky to have. So they already got a leg up with the cash. No question. Yep. And so then it comes down to how are you going to deploy that cash? And mm -hmm. as you know, because you lived it like I do, there's a lot of, of options to spend money, mm -hmm. most of which have a complete depleting or depreciating uh, output to yeah. them. And they're fun and they're exciting, but you know, cars and, and jewelry and things of that nature, you buy them and the day you purchase them, they deplete in value the minute you purchase them. Yeah. And so I think you have to discipline yourself and start focusing on your future and worrying about it because you of all people understand this. It can be over tomorrow. The man above controls when it's going to end. And yeah. it ends for, here's the thing. It ends for all of us, all mm -hmm. coaches and all players. At some point it ends. It's usually due to health reasons that yep. your body just can't do it any longer. It was for me. And, you know, at that point, if you've waited until then, I think it's too late. So get started early and understand that capital is, is a precious thing to get. And if deployed correctly and accurately early, it can have huge dividends. Love it, bro. So let's talk about it. So if I'm not an NFL player, if I'm not a Hunter Goodwin or a Terrence Murphy or, you know, the LeBron James is people all think everybody thinks we're Tom Brady, LeBron James, right. right? These dudes make like generational money, right? Correct. And so what happens is what I'm seeing is a lot of people kind of excuse themselves from your story. So let's just say if you did make it to the NFL, and you still did real estate, would you focus your energy on finding the right deal? Because we always say, if you got the deal, it'll, it'll find capital, right? Walk me through that if that was the scenario. Here's how I'd answer that, Timur. Great question is, the more money you have, let's use LeBron. You can take huge risks. Mm. You can do things that are stupid. You yeah. can do things that may not have a payback until 30. You can be visionary, right? Yeah. You can go out and buy property that's out on the fringe, that's do a crazy idea that's ridiculously risky. And if the payback's for 20 or 30 years, big deal. Yeah, you can wait it out. The guy that starts out with very little, has meager means and very limited resources, that guy cannot afford to make mistakes yeah. because any small deviation from you know performance is going to wreck that person and could bankrupt them. So I think when you're young and you're humble, key humility, you better find good people to advise you and be willing to admit you don't know everything. I'll convert it to something you and I both know is that I know for me as a player, when I got into the NFL, I learned a ton from watching other players, yep, that's right? Good. Mm -hmm. they, they really helped me understand the expectation of practice, of, of how to prepare yourself, the discipline that's required week in and week out to, to have your body sustained for a 20 game season. And those behaviors aren't taught to you by a coach. There's no book really to wow. read. Y you watch those that have been there and that have the experience. And I think. You can replicate that same thing in real estate. No question. And I, I think all too often, while I now feel like an old guy and, and, young, and the youth, I need to listen to because I think they, they do have good ideas. And they do, they do tend to see the world less with less skepticism because they don't have the the, 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 the scar tissue that we have. <laughs> but at the same time, I would ask that, that when I, when I run across a young, young person who 
almost shuns and condemns those that have attained success as aged and out of touch, it almost guarantees there's failure forthcoming for them. Mm. So I think they, we can learn from them and they in turn can learn from us. Mm -hmm. That to me is what's powerful. Cause I, I know for me, I didn't, I didn't want as a player to just have a hot minute and be yeah. able to say, well, I was in, I was drafted and I lasted a day. Yeah. I wanted to have a duration, an actual career. And so for me, I tried to really pick out and isolate guys who were in year eight, year nine, year 10 mm -hmm. and emulate what they've done, their behaviors and actually wear them out with questions, with questions. like, what, what <laughs> like are you I doing? You. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, why, why do you do it this way? Why do you, why do you do this? Why do you do that? And there was always a method to their madness. Yeah. And so I think b business and real estate, especially is very similar to that. Very similar. And I think you're onto something because it's like football, you have to have fundamentals and principles and disciplines. And like you said, if you got a guy who's a Hall of Famer or a 10-year vet, you just watch how he practice. You watch how he carries himself. And so I'll tell people the same thing in real estate. Read the books, watch the podcast. I mean, listen, watch the YouTube videos, listen to the podcast. And it's the information is there. Robert Kiyosaki has a million books, right? All these people have these real estate books. But what I'm seeing is just like you saw with those rookie class that you got drafted with, they're not willing to make the sacrifice and wait and do it the right way. Right. And, and, and T Murph, I think too, the, the, the thing that a lot of, I think players, and I'm going to make an analogy to the, the young prospective real estate guru, mm -hmm. every athlete, I think comes into the NFL with probably an overflated opinion of their skills. <laughs> they think that they're faster, they're smarter, they're they stronger. They find out real quick. Because I think in, in a lot of instances, they came from a, a collegiate program where they were superior, mm -hmm. right? They, they were faster, they were stronger, they were at the top of their class. But then you get, you get put into a hemisphere where it, it's a pretty amazing field of athletic people. Now, mm -hmm. there's, there are these one off of 1% that just can do freakish things, but there's nobody out there that can't run, can't move, and yeah. can't do things athletically. You don't even get a chance to walk in that door. And I think the same holds true in, in real estate. There's a lot of very accomplished, smart people out there that they're there. And if they've lasted for, a, for some time, a mm -hmm. span of time, there's something there. Yeah. You might want to listen and you might want to give it some credit and, and have the humility to ask their opinion and not always be the one to give yours. No, that's good. Yeah. And that's one of the quotes that I've been really digesting because, you know, we're so competitive on the football field. And now I'm realizing business is 10 times more competitive. You know, I've, I read a quote that says business is warfare. And it's like, man, if you can really understand that concept, then coming into real estate at whatever part that you want to enter into this, in the industry or the space, if you walk in arrogant or one of the biggest struggles I see for people, not just athletes, but anybody transitioning, they might have been successful somewhere else in another field. And then they just automatically think that they're going to jump into real estate and that success they're not willing to go back down and work their way up. They just want to cross over and say, hey, I left the NFL or I left this industry and now I'm doing real estate and I should be at the top, right? It's funny, team. If I give you a good example, I, I talked to some guys today and, and you see this in, in probably every genre of real mm -hmm. estate. You see it in hospitality, you see it in multifamily, you see it. I was talking to a guy that that primarily his his area of specialty is, is senior housing and there's a lot of oversupply because institutional capital has determined that that's a priority asset class. Yeah. So they are putting a there's lot of money. fool's gold out there. And mm -hmm. with that, you get inexperienced people playing with fool's gold. Mm -hmm. And so you, you get a lot of oversupply. You get a lot of product that, that does not meet the market needs and will be failed product because you have first timers who've never done it. Who, who have shunned the other experts who've been at it for a long time, and, but they've got access to that precious gold and they're just deploying it. And I mm. think you see a lot of our market cycles where we have crashes are driven by an asset class that becomes the deal of the day, right? And I mean, everybody's flooding it. And everybody's flooding it. And so yeah. you get a lot of people in, in, in an, an, a lopsided market like that where capital is so aggressively wanting to be deployed they'll take chances with inexperienced people mm. that end up having catastrophic results. Yeah. And like we said earlier, so you either go and you learn it 
on your own dime or you learn and kind of sweat equity, build your build your pipeline or build your portfolio or build your track record. And then you can go to people and get capital. So what's one of the most surprising lessons that you learned since you've been in the real estate industry? I have been surprised in specifically multifamily and in hospitality that there is a pretty significant separation or disconnect between those that design and build the product Mm -hmm. and those that operate the product. There seems to be almost big walls that even within companies that do it all, there seems to be very divided high, high walls that separate the two sides. And so you, you, you have an architect or design team that will build a, a product or a built environment that doesn't necessarily match or the needs of what operations need. And mm. so I think trying to, to break down those barriers and, and here's where I think there's a, in a lot of different segments, there are merchant builders mm-hmm. and they aren't in it, nor do want, nor do they operate. They just want to build it, flip it and get out. And so real and quick, Hunter, before you go any further, tell, tell the average listener and myself what a merchant builder is. Okay. So merchant developers are guys that, that, that do exactly as I described. They go out, they do site selection, mm-hmm. they do entitlement, they develop and or build. They sometimes might have their own GC or they just sub that out, mm-hmm. but their goal is to flip it out the minute they get it stabilized. Mm-hmm. So their, their, cons- their motivations aren't about operations. They're not going to be in that project year three, year five, year seven, year 10. So they don't really prioritize, I'm trying to be mindful of my words, the type of mechanical equipment that's going to start to burn out year 10, year 15, The quality of construction. Yeah. They just look at the cost benefit. Well, Mm. if I can get this unit 30 cents cheaper times 3,000 of those, I'm going to make more money when I flip this thing out to some institutional buyer. And in year five, that's his problem. Mm. So that's an example of a merchant developer. That makes sense. And, and you have that in all these different asset classes. And so they really don't care where, where we, we, t- we build our projects now for we'll, the long term for the long term yeah. and we're going to operate those. And so I know this as a buyer who has acquired different assets from groups. That's the first thing I really look at is, what type of developer builder were they in? Were they in this for the short haul and were they merchant in nature or are they owner operators? Are they guys that actually are going to care for this thing into year five, year seven with their exit strategy? Because you tend to get, and there's exceptions to all rules, but in in a general broad brushstroke, you tend to get better product Mm -hmm. and they tend to be more thoughtful and mindful and they don't always pick the cheapest option. And that goes across the scale, whether it's a multi-million dollar uh, multifamily deal, it's a commercial strip center, it's a hotel, or it's a package of single family houses. No question. You got to know what you're buying, right? So you got to really understand the quality of construction and the things you can't see, which is behind the sheetrock, right? So that's good, bro. And and, and T. T Murphy, one more thing on that is that what I don't really think people understand is and I used to do this. So my own failing yep. is that's good. Let's I, talk about I put a lot of stock into the aesthetics. Okay. Mm. Let me describe that. So the, the, the flooring and the wall vinyl and the finishes, what you find out is you better have a good foundation. <laughs> you better have good fenestration, meaning exterior sheathing better not leak. And you better have a good roof. Yep. And all your high cost items are those things that are behind the pretty stuff. If they're bad, that pretty stuff is, is relatively inexpensive in the short haul. And, and if it's, it's reason the depreciation schedules on it are short, this carpet's not lasting 20 years. Nope. It's going to probably be ripped up and pulled out of here in three to five. So we pay attention to the aesthetic things, but those have way less impact Mm -hmm. on the viability of the business than the structure itself. So what did you learn when you said originally you would really focus on the aesthetics and now you've obviously built out checklists or strategy, systems, procedures, or a team to make sure that they're checking all those things? What did you, did you create a process for that or did you? We have, we have a due diligence checklist that has been added to over the years and, and it looks into, you know, we're going to look into the floor assembly. We're going to look into the original plans and specs and see was what was built 
per the design, mm-hmm. because you find out a lot that there are ad libs done in the field and yep. you're not always getting what was on the plans. And so we've learned to look behind the walls, um, metaphorically mm-hmm. and really put a lot of stock into, especially in a town like this, where you have, a, a, our community is really, a, it's a, it's a big clay ball between the Brazos river and the Navasota river. So you get a lot of movement, you get a lot of plasticity index. So you can see if you have an eye for it, a lot of the settling, uh, the consequential damage yeah. from bad structure, right? Mm-hmm. You'll see hairline cracks. You'll see a lot of this, a lot of that. You're going to get some of that no matter what you can't yeah. stop at all. But I cannot tell you, I could sit here right now and probably name five projects like that, that are big, expensive, multi-million dollar commercial projects that didn't appropriately account for the structure. And it ended up having millions of dollars of damage wow. because they didn't understand or know the market like yeah. they should. Wow. That's good, bro. So what's the biggest opportunity you see in the next 12 to 24 months in the real estate industry? What do you see with obviously COVID-19 and the election and everything that's going on? You know, everything, like you said, has cycles. And then you start seeing these opportunities. I remember at one point, you know, self-storage was a big deal. Then multifamily. Now it's industrial, whatever. What do you kind of see over the next 12 to 24 months? You know, I think, Terrence, speaking at a macro level, Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of the underbelly of of real estate is shaky in a lot of segments right now. Um, Travel and tourism. Uh, anyone that falls in that category of what, let's use a more, a broader term hospitality. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's going to be some opportunities in that space to a, you're not going to see much on the development side. If you look at just from the banking and lending perspective, that's, that's pretty much shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, No one is going to bank that product. So you're not going to have much supply added over the next 24 to 36 months. And I think you're going to have a lot of people who are already on the brink of, of, capitulating Mm -hmm. and depending on what happens with COVID-19 over the next three to six months, that, that capitulation could be imminent. Yeah. Um, I think in office, you know, there's this, there's this great debate as we sit in this office with all these people today that, you know, office is done and I tend to have a different, I think, I think the market at large overreacts to things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know about your experience. I'll tell you mine real quick is that we have about 75 people in our corporate office and like you were deemed an essential business. So we never closed, Yep. but we made available to people. If you're uncomfortable and you want to go home, home. we'll make accommodations. Well, at the initial onset, you know, March 13th, that name, that, that date will forever be embedded in my (laughs) head. Um, I think like March the 9th when the NBA kind of canceled practice, well, or canceled their season. We probably had maybe 10% of our workforce, so seven, seven, eight people that left. And I would say, Terrence, within two to three weeks, the vast majority of those people came, came, back. came back because they found that, that there were issues at home. Their home wasn't big enough. Their kids were not in school and were bothering them. They couldn't stay focused. They couldn't get work done. Their network wasn't sufficient. They had unreliable internet. It, it was a myriad of reasons kind of all over the place. I think this is funny too, Terrence, is in the same vein as we talk about is office dead. Mm-hmm. The senior guy I talked to today, huge, they build senior facilities all over the country. Millions and millions of dollars of assets, hundreds of millions of assets on the ground. And do you know what he told me about the, 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 the elderly, the senior housing? Mm-hmm. He said the most important thing for the health and viability of a senior, it's not nutrition, it's not access to medicine. It's socialization. Wow. Number one. Wow. And what COVID-19 is doing to so many of us is they're victimizing us of our socialization. Mm -hmm. For guys like you and I, I have a wife and two great kids. So I go home every night to a wife and two great kids. I can't tell you how many singles that work for me who go home to an empty house. And when you're at home all day and you get no socialization, you come at night, there's no, it's the same environment. I have friends of mine who are single and they're, uh, depressed. It's getting I tough. mean, yeah, so it's, it's getting very hard on them. So I think office, so you feel I, I'm like gonna that, land, no, that's good. So you feel like that's going to impact and really keep office. Well, office is being so negatively viewed right now. I think that there could be some opportunities for acquisition of office in strategic markets. That's I think good. that's another asset class that the world is writing off as done. Mm-hmm. 
I don't think it's done. Yeah. I think there's so hospitality, which includes restaurants, definitely office. And as you said, you know, right now, multifamily industrial are, are as hot as, hot. as coals and fire. So, <laughs> They're hot. you know, we'll see how that shakes out over the long term. And when you're, like you said, your due diligence, when you're just kind of taking a, a bird's eye view over a project, are you looking at a cap rate? Or are you saying, hey, here's the cap rate? Obviously, there's more things to it when you really dig into the property. But I, I get a lot of people say, if I just want to just kind of take a quick glance, Terrence, are you looking at ROI, cap rate? What are you looking at when you're just evaluating the property? So to me, you know, cap rates are kind of a false, um, in my opinion, they're like a temptress. They're a little bit alluring. Yeah. For example, pre-COVID, Class A multifamily was trading in the mid sixes, which I thought was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Today, it's sub five on Class wow. A stuff. So. When, when you look at re the relativity of EBITDA being consistent during that period of time, it's remaining unchanged, and you then compress the cap rate by point, point and a half, the asset value impact is, is significant. So, you know, cap rates are so much affected by external forces. Mm -hmm. You know, the demand in the market, um, there's a direct correlation to interest rate drop. All those things to me are things that, are, that I'm not smart enough to predict. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't tell you what interest rates are going to do over the period of, of, of three to five years. Um, so I rather look at the market and the business itself. And, you know, do I see over the long haul and, and we try to underwrite our deals with a longer horizon. Um, we're not, we're not timing, you know, get in, get out. We're, we're more of a seven to 10 year hold hold. Mm -hmm. And we just look at, you know, do we, do we understand the market? Do we believe in the long-term viability of the market? Is it a market that has a, a trend that's, that's increasing, not decreasing? And when you say a market, like to me, Houston could be broken down to like 40 sub-markets. I, I mean, it is on. a massive, and each one of those could operate. Bel Air can be different than West U. And, and you know, it, it, there's, there's a, when I say market, that you need to really hone down. And so do I like the business? Do I like the viability of it long-term? Do I like the market? And do I believe I'm getting in at, at a price right point that is, afford, in my mind, justified? Yeah. Because we all know you make money when you buy. And um, so if you, were, if you were speaking to someone with no experience who's wanting to think about becoming a real estate entrepreneur, right? Where would you tell them to start? Would you give them a book to read? Would you say find a mentor? You know, if, if I were your little brother or son or you, hey, son, go start here, right? Or if your sister, hey, go start here because I get that question all the time. Right. So you, you had asked me, one of the books that I really like is Real Estate Investments and How to Make Them. Uh, Mitt Tanzer is the, is the author of that. I think books are great. I think they're, you know, I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer it with a bit of a generic answer. Sound like a politician, but <laughs> I, I think the approach to getting started is multifaceted, kind of like hiring somebody. So yep. one, you, you scan the resume Two, you want, I always believe in an in-person interview because yep. there's nothing that is impactful as the face-to-face. -face. And three, we use something called the Berkman, which is a profiling, yep. uh, uh, personality, profile. personality profile test. And so we call it the three-legged stool is all of those end up being contributory in the ultimate decision. Mm -hmm. So for me, real estate, and the decision to how to proceed and where to proceed is multifaceted as well. It's a combination of books. It's a combination of identifying spheres of influence who are relative to where you're trying to go and asking them questions. And then I think just a lot of it is the, is a discipline and the grit of one thing that is advantageous for today's investor that was harder when we first got started is the amount of data mm -hmm. that is readily available to you. Yeah, it's you can unbelievable. You can Google and get anything. You can Google and get anything. And so I think studying the data and then coming up with your own interpretation and then validating with an expert. Through due diligence. Are these, are these assumptions doable? Right. Do you think these, you know, is my predicted rent growth sustainable? Is it, is my, or my expense loads, are they correctly underwritten? Do you think, because because you have all these guys, Terrence, that are in the debt and equity world who underwrite deals every day, they love to look at something, right? And mm -hmm. and to see uh, they have analysts that mm -hmm. like Berkadia and and J P Moore. I mean, they have analysts, sees of them, 
if you know one, send it to them and go, hey, man, take a look at my assumptions. Do you think these look, are they at market? Are these reasonable? Are, is the rent growth reasonable? Are the expense load growth reasonable? Are my gross potential rents reasonable? And just ask them to validate your data. That's perfect. Because you got to get yourself out there. A lot of times people want to sit at home and try to build a network. Like you got to put yourself out there, man. You got to be willing to be uncomfortable and ask people. And that's tough for people like us to do because for so many, t- so many scenarios, we've been the fastest, the strongest, the smartest. The, but that's that transition that I'm always talking about. When people are changing careers or when athletes are trained, they, they don't want to humble themselves and say, hey, Hunter, man, I don't know. I don't know what's next for me. Right. Point me in the right direction. And, and I, I agree with you, T. Murph. I mean, I was always surprised. I was a union rep for three years and, and you, you always want to make yourself available to people. And man, if you need something, come to me. And, and I, they don't come. And to if you. I don't know the answer, I commit, I'll get it. And then something bad happens. You find out after the fact, and then you just go to them in disbelief and go, dude, why? Like I told you to come to me and I'd help. Why didn't you do it? And then they kind of just look at their feet and go, man, I just couldn't bring myself to, wow. to ask for help. And how many people do you and I both know who made catastrophic decisions, life and or business yeah. and or whatever relationship wise that could have been circumvented had they had the reached out humility to ask for help? Well, yeah, that's hell. That needs to be the foundation of this podcast. I mean, at the end of the day, Humble yourself. God's going to put people in your path. You just got to be willing to, first off, the discipline, like you said earlier, watching those vets. And then I bet there was a time you went to one of those vets and said, hey, man, I've been seeing every practice you do this. Can you show me how to do that? And for me, I can tell you, yeah, absolutely. I've never had um, anyone tell me no. Me either. I've never, never. I mean, yep. now was I, I, I always tell the story when I, uh, when I came to a and I was asked to change positions. So I was a tight end. There was like five tight ends on the roster and Sherman, Mike Sherman came to me and said, Hey man, you need to blow up, be an offensive lineman and you'll start right mm-hmm. out of the gate because we have nobody. Matter of fact, they were in the spring game. They wouldn't even let me wear my name on my Jersey cause they were trying to recruit a bunch of dudes and didn't want. They, they want to think I was just some slap. Wow. So, and, and all that, it, what I learned is as I was transitioning over, there was a guy, I think you know, Ken Reeves, who yep. Ken had, had left A&M in the 80s, gone on and had a good career. Philadelphia Eagles, I think was most of his career. And he was back living in Kane Hall. And I'll never forget, he drove this big, sweet Mercedes <laughs> and it had these sweet rims. And, you know, Ken just was a suave he's dude. A cool dude. He's, a, he's a cool cat, kind of had a, had a walk to him and he was getting his masters. And I, I just remember asking someone like, who, who is that guy? Like, you know, what's his story? And as they told me his story, he, he was a great, you know, back then we didn't have Wikipedia. So yeah. you, you had to actually <laughs> dig it up, but they were like, he was a, you know, an all pro left tackle went against LT at the giants. He's a hell of a player. Yeah. So I just remember one, it took a lot of courage. I'm not going to lie, but I went up to him one day and I was like, Hey man, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm being asked to transition from this position to that position and I really don't know what I'm doing, would you be willing to give me some pointers? And he's like, dude, tomorrow four o'clock work? Wow. And I'm like, yeah, man, for sure. Wow. So that, we, that might've been a pivot for you, man. No, no question. I yeah. give him credit to this day. He did a leadership uh, speech to my team back in December, but Ken, you know, took me out there and for probably a solid six weeks taught me some very in, you know, invaluable things about the position, about how to think, techniques I could work on. So when I came back for that fall, you tore some people up. Yeah, I was just a different person, and, yeah. and he he not only helped me with the technical side of the game, but I think he really broadened my horizon on the mental side, mm-hmm. and he gave a lot of color in how to approach preparation for your opponent. That's good, and how to watch film and the things to look at. So, which is all the same stuff we're talking right. about, bro. It's the same in business, it's right? The same same in business. So you get a mentor who's been in the game, who's done it at a high level. They're going to be able to meet you for six weeks in a row and show you some moves that no PhD professor, no disrespect can tell you unless they've been an investor or been in real estate, they can show you the real life. Cause when the bullets start flying, like we always say on the football field, that's when you know what you do, who you're dealing with. No question. Yeah, that's good, bro. That's good. 
I mean, I got a, I got a couple more thoughts, man, I want to run by you. So what technology do you see? What new innovation or technology do you see entering the space or at your company that y'all may be looking at or trying to incorporate? And how do you see that change in the industry? So there are so many technology solutions today for every, you want a CRM, there's Salesforce, there's <laughs> HubSpot, there's, I mean, there's hundreds. Here's what I'll say where we have failed. Mm-hmm. And, and I was given this term and I, I'm assuming it's something that's kind of known in the technology world, but they called it technology debt. Technology um, debt. I'll explain that T Murph as it was explained to me, but here's what happens often is whatever the, t- if you're rolling out an accounting software or a, a payroll or HR, human capital management system, or a sales, a CRM, a customer, whatever it is, whatever that application is you're rolling out. Oftentimes when you roll it out the first time, mm-hmm. it is, it, it, people don't know what all the tools that it offers and how it's going to work. And so the technology debt is you almost have to have to go through one failed cycle, mm. finding out and identifying all the things that the technology won't do before you're appropriately educated to truly validate a next the full version. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah. In order to get the full value out of the full value proposition, you got to go and tinker with some stuff. Exactly. Let's equate it to like purchasing a car. So yeah. if, if I gave you all the money in the world and tomorrow you went out and, and you know, the, the first car you ever bought was a Bugatti, you probably wouldn't know how to drive the damn thing. Mm-hmm. You'd be confused. You, yep. you, there'd all these things because it would overwhelm you. But if you bought a Cadillac and you drove it for six months and you realize, man, it doesn't do this right. It doesn't do that right you would know much better what to look for in that in second, level. in the next level. So yep. I think there's a process you have to go through with technology. And I will say this, that in my experience, I have yet to meet a technology that can do everything. Everything. They all have shortcomings. They all have challenges. You will have workarounds. And to me, buy-in is imperative, right? You, yep. you have to have buy-in from the group because if you're striving and looking for perfection, it doesn't exist. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. And I see that all the time in the real estate industry. The, we call it the shiny object syndrome. So it's this CRM is awesome. This technology is awesome. This AI is awesome. And then they jump on it. You sign up for your 12, 24 months, six months in. Let's shift to this. And so you just see people just jumping in and out of the different technology. And it's like you said, just really focusing on one and sticking with it. And, and, and T Murph, you know, this it's, there is an exhausting amount of bandwidth that goes into rolling out a technology. And Mm so you brought this up. I can't remember if it was on air or off air, but I think you were referencing your wife is on you about, you know, managing your time better. And I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. That's a failure for me too. But if you, if you go back and look at the, the implementation of a software and the amount of time that's taken away from what you, what, what all these people are here to do, which is sell real estate and make money Mm -hmm. every minute that they're trying to figure out a technology or how to log on or dual authentication, you're, you're, you're losing out. There's an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. You can't, if you're constantly chasing the next best thing, there will be 10 next best things around every corner. Yeah. And it'll hurt you. Yeah. So be careful. Yeah, that's good. (laughs) So what are you doing to grow right now? Obviously, the real estate entrepreneur of Terrence Murphy is high level real estate entrepreneurs. You have an amazing track record with your commercial division, the hospitality. You obviously have grown a personal portfolio of investment properties. What are you doing right now to grow as the real estate entrepreneur? So I think that the biggest debate that my partner and I have is the, are we too, do we do too many things? And Mm. I'll say that we fight that day in and day out. And I, I think that now that we're in COVID-19, we're thankful that we do a lot of different things. Yeah, or the multiple. The guys that I know that are strictly hospitality. They're hurting. Or, oh, they're suffering, man. I mean, yeah. I got a friend of mine that's a, that's a celebrity chef restaurant guy. And I mean, they're, they're ter- I, I would say the answer is terrified. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at, at New York City, I haven't validated this, but I was told there's there's over 2,000 restaurants in New York City that have closed permanently and will never reopen. Wow. So it, you look at the impact to, to certain segments driven by COVID, I think our diversity has helped us weather the storm well. We're 
in the process right now of of implementing or building kind of the infrastructure of doing a big uh, marketing push going into 21. So we think that there's going to be some market share, some market share available. Yep. And I think that, you know, if there is a, a hope certificate and or saving grace for you and I, I believe it's this, that we're in a great state. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a a tremendous migration of uh, an influx of people moving here every day. I think there will be a continuation of that. We still offer a very low cost of living. We Mm -hmm. still offer very good public schools. And as long as those things can remain and don't change, I think Texas will be very appealing and we're right in the center of that triangle. So I think we're in a very high growth area that's going to grow and grow and grow well into the future. Yeah. Cause I think Austin now is five or six years in a row, the fastest growing city in America. So you got Austin, San Antonio, you go North, you got Dallas, Fort Worth, you go Southeast, you got Houston in the woodlands, you draw a triangle on the map, college station right in the middle of it. Exactly. Yeah. That's some opportunity there, bro. So what's your big why, man? Why are you a real estate entrepreneur? Why are you still in the industry? What, what, what wakes you up every day? You know, I, I enjoy the, the, the people in the process, I think. Um, I'm over operations, so I deal with our people every day. And I, I kind of look at it like we got a new C, uh, CFO about six months ago, and I know he that. calls me the coach. <laughs> and I, I took, you know, I think he was nervous when that got out because he was doing it behind my back. But <laughs> I was like, man, I take pride in that. So I, I enjoy the, I enjoy people. I enjoy the team component. It was very, I think it's very hard for us to leave that team environment mm-hmm. when you're part of something bigger and you've been around people you respect every day. Yeah, man. And there's just a, there's a connection there that others don't really understand. I think the military is similar in that, yep. but you just, you endure so many tough things and so much pain together that, that it, it kind of forges, welds you together. That mm-hmm. sounds odd, but it does. And, I miss that a lot. I think this has given that back to me in some degree. Yeah, that family, that team. Exactly. And and I think I really enjoy and thrive in that environment. So I get up every day and I enjoy being part of a team, um, being a leader on that team and adding value, hopefully to the greater good. And my success is their success and their success is my success. And I, that, that's not cliche. I mean, yeah, one individual can't win a game. 11 guys working together wins the game. And I think that's paramount for me and what motivates me. Yeah, we've seen that time and time again. Well, you had some books you recommended. I want to talk about that real quick. It's real estate investments and how to make them. You, you know, you referenced that earlier. And extreme ownership, how Navy SEALs lead and win. Tell me what's your one takeaway from the real estate investments and how to make them. What would be that one aha when you read that book? Kind of a, you know. God, Terrence, it's been 20 years. Oh, no, I'm hitting you with some stuff. Yeah. I think it does a really good job of getting into what we talked about earlier, just how important analysis is. Yeah, and building a team and building due diligence. And, and data, right, yeah. is is you have to you have to get access to the right data and then you have to interpret the data. And I will caution you, 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 it's funny how you brought this up, but I think kids today have a, almost a religious belief related to technology. Mm. And they think that technology, especially artificial intelligence, isn't flawed. And without getting into a very deep dive here, let me tell you that our industry in hospitality has 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 implemented very sophisticated revenue management models for years. The airline industry was the leader. Hospitality has followed right that. And, and here's the deal. The predictive future analysis is based in historical data. And the thing that historical data cannot tell you are events of force majeure, i.e., Mm COVID-19. There's no way that the predictive models would have forecasted this massive decline in demand because it didn't happen in the past. They can't forecast a road shutting down, maybe affecting your access to your building. They can't forecast a forest fire. They can't forecast a flood. They can't forecast a fire. They can't forecast an economic recession. So there's a lot of flaws relying holistically on technology as your source of data. Mm. You can be led astray. So I think it should be contributory, but not solely relied on. And I think, I don't believe you should ever buy anything 
that you haven't touched, walked, and looked at yourself. Every time. Right? It's kind of like the interview process. I don't want to hire someone I've never met. Mm -hmm. I don't care how good they look on a resume. <laughs> I don't care how awesome their personality yeah. profile comes back. You. I got to touch you and see yep. you and make sure you're real. Yep. I'm never going to trust external systems like solely that. to be the, the, the absolute in making a decision of that nature. Because that just turns into speculation. No question. In speculation, my friend, only do that if you're LeBron James, <laughs> right? Yeah. If, yep. you're, if you're a billionaire, you can get away with it. But the rest of us, I, I can't get away with it. And that's what I've been seeing so many people saying, I want to get into flipping houses and flipping multifamily and I'll just tie it up and do this. And it's like, but are you going to drive there? Are you going to fly there? Are you going to see it? So I heard a banker tell me early and only in my real estate career, if you can't win in your back backyard, you shouldn't be playing in someone else's backyard. Well, in team, I, I love that saying. And, and one thing I'll say is that we've been asked a lot about, you know, well, why don't you do stuff outside of Texas? Because everyone's moving to Texas. Like, why, <laughs> why do I want to go to California when everyone hates the place and they're leaving left and right? And they're yeah. passing restrictions there daily that make it almost impossible for you to invest capital, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, rent restrictions and eviction issues. And I mean, when you, when you can't, raise rents, you're going to see a mass migration of capital out of those places. Man. You're already seeing it. I mean, That's you're really seeing crazy. people leaving there in, in, I know personally 15 people that have migration. left California and have moved to Texas because they can't afford to live in California. So if you don't think it's real, it's real. And I think we, we're, we're, we're the catchers met, right? We're mm -hmm. in the center of the country. And I think we're catching a lot of that exportation of, of humanity. Yeah. It's nothing a good like thing. the state of Texas, man. Well, man, I appreciate your time, brother. If you wanted to leave, is there anything else that you wanted to leave with our audience that we might not have covered or any final thoughts? Well, I want to congratulate you on all you've done. And I want to say appreciate that, it, you know, I think you touched on it and I'm going to say it, whether it gets us in trouble or not. I do think that, that, that Denny Green, I miss him dearly, but he used to always say faith, family, and football. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a very important beacon in our, in our life. I think you, you have to believe in something. Yep. Um, and I think faith is important for me. I know it's important for you. Yep. Um, family is a critical piece. I think they're a support network. And I know for me, I can rely on my wife to tell me how wrong I am most days. <laughs> um, the football piece is gone, but let's replace that with real estate. So, yep. you know, I, I think uh, in this day and age with all the turmoil, it is very nice to return home and have your faith and have your family. Yeah, that's good, bro. And then have a brother. You know, that's the thing I miss about sports, man. When we're in that game and we're out there, we're in 105 degrees, man, we truly love each other, bro. And man, we no still question. do. And no I, question. you know, and I miss that about our country where we can sit across the table from each other and it's Hunter and Terrence and it's our hearts and it has nothing to do with anything else. Yes, we're both believers, but at the same time, it's not about my skin tone. It's not about, it's just, Hey man, I love you. You love me. Right. Let's talk shop. Let's love our families. And man, cause if the, if the bullets start flying, I know you got my back and you know I got yours. No question. So, man, I thank you for being on, bro. Hopefully they don't fly. <laughs> I, <laughs> Let's pray that I, that's I, not the I, case. I hope they but don't. It, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised. It's, 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 it's crazy tumultuous times, times man. It's crazy times, man. Well, man, I'm proud of you as the real estate entrepreneur that you are, bro. And you were one of the first people when I decided to retire after being paralyzed and going through that journey of depression and everything, saying, who is somebody that I can look to to kind of point me in the right direction, man. And you were one of the first Thank people you. in this town that took, that took me, you know, took me in at 23 years old, bro. I was 20, 22 or 23. So, man, I love you for that. And I'll always be loyal Absolutely, to you for that, bro. man. Appreciate Absolutely. it, man. Thank you. Bro. A lot of fun. Thanks yep. for having me. Yes, Enjoyed sir. it. All right, man.